Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Frederick Winsness with the NetHope Solutions Center, and uh, we are delighted to welcome you to yet another No Loss Generation Tech Task Force webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about building resilient higher education spaces for displaced population populations, and we have InZone and HP joining us today. Before we get started, I just want to go over uh, some quick housekeeping rules. Uh, we do want to make this as interactive as possible, so please open the chat window in WebEx and um, uh, um, listen uh, or, or post your questions there, and we will facilitate a Q&A session towards the end of the hour today. Uh, we're also uh, recording the session today, and the recording and the slides that are being presented will be posted to the NetApp Solutions Center, and there'll be a follow-up mail with a pointer to that location uh, later as well, uh, later today. And uh, as you will see when we stop the webinar today, you will get a uh, webinar satisfaction poll in your browser. We'd certainly appreciate it if you took a couple extra minutes to answer those things to help us improve this webinar series um, over time. And I think that's all we need for the housekeeping slides. I'm going to turn it over to Leila Toplik. She is uh, driving the No Loss Generation Tech Task Force efforts here at NetHope. So over to you, Leila. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, last NLG Tech Task Force webinar for the year. Um, it's uh, we're excited very much for this discussion that we're going to have in the next uh, few minutes. Um, just briefly, for those of you who are new to the No Loss Generation Technology Task Force and our monthly webinars, welcome. Um, this task force was set up by NetHope and the No Loss Generation Initiative um, with the support from Microsoft and TripAdvisor, and we've been focusing on facilitating collaboration both within the humanitarian sector as well as between the humanitarian sector and the private sector with a focus on technology-enabled programs for conflict-affected children and youth. So specifically meeting the needs like education, employment, participation, and protection. And the task force, as you can see from this logo wall, is open to all global and local NGOs, UN agencies, private sector companies, academic institutions, social entrepreneurs, and host governments. And we've had over 70 different organizations join us uh, since we launched the task force in 2017. Um, again, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to benefit from some of the resources that we've uh, published over the past to well, nearly two years, we just want to call your attention to several of those resources. Um, one, it's um, really this webinar series. Um, there's some really there's some really excellent information on program design, on technology tools, educational content, and more, um, ranging from language learning, higher education opportunities. Um, uh, participation, livelihoods, so a number of excellent resources, and Frederick is sharing the link in the chat window. We've also published the first private sector engagement guide for the No Loss Generation Initiative that's being used by over 30 UN and global NGO agencies. So if you are an NGO interested in um, engaging with the private sector, you're welcome to use that private sector guide. Also, if you're a private sector company, technology company, and interested in knowing how you can support the work of those who are meeting the needs of conflict-affected children and youth, uh, please do take a look at that guide and, and send us your, your examples and your feedback. And then lastly, um, there's a whole set of other resources and research reports that are available to all of you. Do let us know through the poll for this uh, webinar if you have any additional ideas or feedback in terms of what we should cover next. Now, on to the feature presentation on today's webinar. Um, I must say, as a, as a former refugee teacher myself and also one of the the 1% of refugees that have had the opportunity to go to university. I am incredibly excited about the discussion we're about to have with the University of Geneva and HP. Um, this partnership is focusing on higher education opportunities for refugees um, and more broadly giving refugee youth opportunities for lifelong learning. So you'll hear 
two examples, one in Africa and the second one in the Middle East. Um, you'll hear about how technology is uh, supporting the higher education programs, and then also why cross-sector partnerships are critical for making higher education opportunities viable for refugee youth. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the partners from the University of Geneva, that would be Barbara and Paul, and together also with Innocent, who is uh, dialing in from Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, and uh, Ellen from um, HP, who will be talking about the work that HP is doing with the University of Geneva. Over to you, Barbara, to kick us off with the feature presentation. Thank you. Barbara, you're ready to go. Yes. Well, thank you, Leila, for the introduction. And uh, I'm also very, very excited uh, about uh, you know, today's discussion and uh, would like to uh, turn over to our presentation now. Um, if Frederick can uh, release the other presentation, then I can uh, kick in with mine. You can just go ahead and uh, share your desktop. Uh, just a second, Frederick. I'm uh, unfortunately not. Uh, I'm, I'm locked into yours. I'm sorry. Okay, let me. Maybe let me, you can just change over to yours. Yep, yeah, I will do that very quickly. Hold on. That's All right. First slide and uh, Good, yeah. make you presenter now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, to everyone, and thank you also uh, to uh, Leila and uh, the No Lost Generation uh, Task Force for inviting us to speak on how we integrate technology and pedagogy in challenging higher education spaces can turn over to the next one, uh, Frederick, please. Um, we really have tried to focus on uh, the kind of change that we want to see. Uh, and the change we want to see is really providing inclusive and equitable quality higher education for sustainable development, really looking uh, at higher education and displacement against uh, all of the 17 sustainable development goals and how we as higher education institutions can actually um, become uh, actors in that space. Um, the problems that we encounter are obviously manifold. There are fragility, there are conflict, uh, we work in low resource environments, we encounter a large diversity of languages and cultures. And so in trying to find solutions, uh, we have been trying to look at you know, what is feasible uh, in collaboration with uh, the learners that we work with and have been working with for uh, quite some time now. Um, transformative pedagogy is actually at the center uh, of what we do. Uh, and everything else that we develop works around that. Um, Adaptive technology is the second key element in it, uh, and technology and pedagogy are always, always seen uh, in a kind of synergetic relationship with each other. Uh, and I'll explain that a little later again uh, in more detail. Uh, and our focus is really on the 21st century skills. So looking at you know, what the design elements are, uh, yes, you know, a theory of change that I was just trying uh, to describe to you very briefly, uh, looking at the digital and the collaborative learning ecosystem that makes that change possible uh, and that ultimately uh, leads us to opportunities for uh, refugee, not just engagement, but actually refugee management. And I think that is a very important step for us. Uh, we feel it situated at the higher education uh, level. Um, our learners want to acquire skills and competencies that put them in the driver's seat. Uh, I think for far too long and for many of the services that they require, uh, they are more 
put in at the receiving end of things. Whereas with higher education and uh, the kinds of skills and competencies they acquire, they should be really empowered uh, to take over themselves. If we can move on. So this is just a very quick overview, uh, just to give you a taste of uh, who our learners are, the many faces, beautiful faces uh, of our learners that we work with. Um, but uh, also looking at how we try and uh, integrate pedagogy, space, and technology. And you will not hear us talk really a lot about uh, delivering programs and courses. Actually, you, won't, you will rarely hear us talking about providing higher education. Uh, we're always talking about building higher education spaces because for us, that is, uh, from, from, from a conceptual point of view, the key to what we do and how we partner. Uh, spaces are there for people to build community in. Uh, and higher education is not just about uh, allowing a few to access uh, courses. It is really about how competencies and skills, including livelihood skills and life skills, are being acquired and how these skills are then actually benefiting whole communities. So this is where the emphasis on the education spaces comes in, and that emphasis is of, of great significance to us. So pedagogy, space, and technology. Uh, again, space enables certain pedagogies and makes others a bit more difficult. It also enables the use of certain technologies and makes the use of others a bit more difficult. Um, and pedagogical approaches uh, require certain technologies and certain applications and certain tools. Uh, and some of these uh, tools are obviously a bit more challenging to use in those environments. So you can see this interrelationship between these three elements. But the space is also looked at in terms of where people learn. And I think you probably have heard a lot about anytime, anywhere learning or ubiquitous learning. And we initially thought, before we did quite a bit of research on this, that you know, learning happens in our learning hubs. Far be it from that. Learners actually learn uh, in many different places. And the camp context is very constrained. You cannot stay in the learning hub for a very long time. There are curfews, there are movement restrictions, there, there, are, there are all sorts of constraints. Uh, that unfortunately make it very difficult for you uh, to um, be in front of a computer or uh, be in touch with somebody else. So learning happens in very structured environments, uh, in the learning hub, maybe face-to-face -face even, and we do go to the camp as well. Uh, we do provide face-to-face -face seminars uh, in addition to the large part of our programming being offered online. Uh, but learning is also happening in places that we've built, such as cafes. We've built cafes in refugee camps. Uh, cafes are places where people socialize. And a lot of learning happens actually when people socialize and talk to each other and discuss some of the very difficult topics uh, that are the core of some of the courses that uh, we run, such as human rights and children's rights and ethics and global health and global poverty. Uh, all those courses come with very challenging topics that refugees really want to engage with very actively and discuss amongst each other. But learning also happens in the shelter. And I think this is really where some of the knowledge that our refugee learners acquire can be transmitted to their families and ultimately to the community. Learning, in short, is all about the connections whether it's in the hub, whether it's in the cafe, whether it's in the family, whether it's in the community. It's trying to design a learning environment that really takes advantage of all possible connections. And by connecting people with each other, we're rebuilding broken communities. We're actually incidentally providing an opportunity for, uh, for our learners to think about ways in which they can rebuild communities because chances are, and if you look at the lifespan of some of the world's largest refugee camps going into you know, 20 plus years, uh, chances are that these communities are going to have to last for quite some time. It, 
So very quickly, just to give you some uh, examples of where the learning happens here in the learning hubs, you see one example. This is a repurposed shipping container that actually has provided uh, quite uh, good learning, well, quite good opportunities for refugees to engage in. Uh, right now, it's been actually extended into a larger structure, um, but this is one of the earlier pictures of it. Uh, and inside, you see refugee learners engaging with different types of technology, whether it's a Raspberry Pi uh, tool or a standard desktop computer or mobile phones. Uh, inside these centers, a lot of things are happening. And the next, please. But sometimes, you know, learners also move outside. Uh, they move outside to discuss, or when it's too hot inside, uh, they move into the, uh, into the coffee house uh, in order to socialize. Uh, the socializing also involves uh, a significant component of social-emotional learning. Here you can see the refugee wall where refugees post their poems or their hopes and aspirations uh, or you know, even objectives uh, for the different courses that they attend. So local learning spaces uh, that become globally relevant. Uh, and I think here really we can start looking at uh, how the refugee camps and the learning spaces we design and develop and build up in there with our refugee learners how they connect actually to the world at large. And the world at large, that is both uh, the students at the University of Geneva who become very actively involved, and Paul will share with you a little bit more about that, about our learning environment, which you have a graphic here in the center of this slide. Um, but uh, learners also engage uh, with students and professors at our partner universities. We have close partnerships with uh, Purdue University and with MIT, um, but also with other uh, university partners with whom uh, we actually share courses uh, that we um, either credential ourselves or share credentialing with uh, other partner universities. So globally relevant is really uh, what a local learning space needs to be, connecting to that outside world, uh, especially when uh, your movement is severely restricted. Okay. Um, our learning ecosystem uh, then is, yeah, our learning ecosystem is inhabited by five key actors. Um, the animation should be playing now, Frederick, I think. No? Okay, so um, at the center we have the student who really plays the role of a student everywhere and completing assignments, acquiring new knowledge, working with their, their classmates and so on. Um, they're in the ecosystem then, they're fed into by the lecturer whose main role is to provide course materials to the student, to encourage new knowledge generation, uh, to evaluate grades and so on. Uh, this pedagogical role is supported by the online tutor who is typically a PhD level student from our university or one of our partner universities who meets the students on ICT platforms such as WhatsApp maybe once a week for a few hours to discuss the, the learning materials, to um, expand on, on what's been discussed in class um, and to work together with all the members of the, of the course uh, to, to really develop the learning points of that week. They're supported on the ground then by an on-site fa facilitator whose kind of main role is to provide technical support um, in everything from getting the students themselves onto the learning platform to making sure everybody uh, comes to the, the learning hub on time, taking attendance, um, working with everybody else in the, in the ecosystem to, to try to ensure a smooth day-to-day -day running of the course for the students on the ground. Um, kind of overriding all of this is the course coordinator who really plays the kind of management role, uh, working together with all of the members of the ecosystem to, to try to ensure a smooth running of the course. Um, the student then really is the center of, of, of the collaborative learning ecosystem and everything that we do is, it is for their learning. Uh, the ecosystem is quite flexible and adaptable to their needs and also the needs of the course. So for example, if you, if you need to, um, if one student needs extra attention, they can connect with the, the um, online tutor over WhatsApp and uh, you know, discuss the topic a little bit more, try to increase their learning. 
Um, so the student really is the core of the of, of the learning ecosystem, and um, it's it's been developed to really try to support their progressive uh, learning autonomy. Okay, I think there's a bit of a lag in the um, in the graphic. Do you want me to uh, let it play out, uh, Paul? Or yeah, yeah. So that's just the end of it. It's just really kind of trying to emphasize how everybody works together um, and plays a specific role to try to ensure that that um, the kind of optimal conditions for the students' uh, learning possibilities are, are encouraged within the ecosystem itself, and that eventually the student becomes, um, you know, a, a, an autonomous learner because all, all of the different key actors are are continually supporting this kind of development uh, for them. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm going to uh, go back to the slides. And uh, there we go. Great. Uh, so really looking at connected learning, uh, looking at you know, what really powers the kind of learning that uh, we're trying uh, to uh, uh, you know, implement in the field in those difficult conditions. And there are like six constructs that from, uh, from a more theoretical point of view have been uh, developed uh, in order to describe connected learning. Uh, it's interest-powered, peer-supported, openly networked, with a shared purpose, academically oriented, and production-centered. And I'll just give you some examples of how you know, we, we are looking at this digital and connected and collaborative learning. Um, maybe on the next slide you'll see um, you know, the interest-powered, yes. Uh, here an example from Azra Camp. Uh, at, uh, during the engineering course that we uh, implement with Purdue University, for example, the students uh, you know, identified certain uh, really difficult problems in the camp for which they were trying to find a technical solution. Uh, and here, you know, they designed a solar-powered mosque, for example, because there wasn't enough energy to power all the mosques in the camp. Uh, so trying to get solar power onto them you know, was obviously uh, one of the solutions that they found, and they did that. Um, through the engineering course where they learned engineering design and design thinking skills, which they then were able to transfer onto other courses that were not necessarily engineering oriented. Next one. Uh, we also uh, encourage deeper learning. Uh, learning needs to be academically oriented when you come to higher education. Uh, one of the real advantages, uh, and, and I think the, the, the important contribution that higher education brings into the humanitarian context is really critical thinking. Uh, and I think it's, it's really important that we not lose out uh, on this opportunity of our learners to acquire those critical thinking skills, which are part of the 21st century skills. And we do that really by encouraging deeper learning, asking more difficult questions. Uh, building relationships among learners so that peers can actually also encourage each other with more difficult questions. So deepening learning through conversations. We also need to be production-centered. Uh, one thing that we found in those contexts uh, really is that if we start uh, building those higher education spaces by introducing courses that have a very tangible, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, very relevant output, such as building a solar-powered mosque, for example, uh, that encourages students to produce uh, and really reminds them of just how useful uh, and how applicable uh, some of the results of their thinking of their work are to the context that they live in. It's also important to have a shared purpose. Uh, here is an example of how, how our graduate students here in Geneva, our graduate students in global health, uh, are working very actively, and this is, just happened a couple of weeks ago, are, acting, uh, are working very carefully and, and actively with our students in Kakuma refugee camp uh, to look at, well, how can we actually have an app or ca how can we look uh, to assess uh, the risk of cholera? Uh, and so they were sharing this app uh, with the learners in the camp, and immediately uh, the learners responded and said, yeah, you know, we, we are going to be able to try this out. 
uh, and here is, you know, here's a new app, let's try this out and let's see, because cholera is a real risk in that camp. So making it really relevant again, uh, but also you know, looking again at design thinking, at, at uh, critically assessing the environment, uh, and trying to find solutions uh, that might work and testing them, uh, in, as Innocent will share with you, testing them uh, very, very carefully. Openly networked, uh, yes, we have uh, teams of tutors who are uh, signing up uh, here at the University of Geneva, but also with our partner universities who are actively supporting the learners in the field on a daily basis. I think uh, Paul explained to you just how important that learning support is, how we scaffold our learning environments with different types of technologies. Uh, all with the objective in mind that uh, these learners really require uh, support, but support towards developing learning autonomy. And that's very different from constantly uh, helping and assisting people. So the word aids and assistance are not really words that we have in our vocabulary at all. Uh, everything is focused on, well, how can we actually get them to become autonomous learners? And uh, the collaboration you know, among youth in different contexts actually makes that, uh, makes that quite possible. Peer supported, yes. You know, we can't always be there, and we're rarely there. We go there maybe twice a semester, uh, max. Um, but that requires also on-site support. And here you can see, for example, a group of learners working uh, on designing a sensor for a trash truck, actually, in Azraq refugee camp. Uh, the problem that they've identified is that the trash truck actually often leaves the camp without being full. Uh, and that a lot of the trash in Azra camp doesn't get picked up. Uh, so they developed a sound and a, an audio sensor that would ring the moment the truck was going, trying to leave the camp without being full. So you can see real problems trying uh, to integrate those into a, a, a higher education course, trying to see how, as a group of learners, they can design and develop a solution. I'll turn it over to Innocent now. Yeah, good evening from Kakuma. I'm here to just share some of the, my experience, I mean my experience for the past 10 years that I've been in Kakuma refugee camp. And I've been part of all sorts of, I call them innovation and shifting of paradigm. And you'll find, for example, uh, if you look very well on this picture, I think this kind of picture, uh, they are familiar to what we are used to, to see, mostly for people who never been in a refugee camp or in a emergency settings. They are used to see this kind of picture, people line up, lining up uh, maybe for getting food duration. And here in this instance, people are lining up to get uh, water. And uh, I think everyone should understand the meaning or the impact of water in our life. So you can't live without water. And this is a basic need that people should line up and which is something which uh, at, at other levels, people have already forgotten about this issue, but it is still a preoccupation, it's still something people need to think about here in this context. But now uh, there comes across higher education, which now uh, it's looking uh, on ways how we can do well to make sure that uh, people should not just rely on this. This is not sustainable. This is not uh, providing some kind of, uh, let's say, self-sustenance uh, or resilience. So it's just something which is there. It's just, I can call it for mercy because at some point it might shut down, it might disappear, and no one among the people who are getting this assistance will be able to reactivate the system. So the higher education now is trying to enable these people. And I won't talk about these people, but I talk about us because I'm most part of these people. It's trying to enable us to just shift from lining up for a food ration to become uh, people who are problem solvers, people who are there to think critically, to bring solutions to our own problems, and uh, people who are there also to share experience so that the world outside there understand maybe what is going on into these emergency settings so that they can also come up with solutions that works and come up with long-term responses. Because when you look very well, at this kind of assistance, they are not there to live forever. They are kind of, let's say, uh, temporary. But temporary until when? Like myself now, 10 years. 
So I won't call it again temporary, but I call it something which we need to cope and find ways of how we should live with this now, how we can manage this. And that's where now education come across to just uh, bring solution to this one. And there are so many challenges to run higher education in these settings. I've been here, we have seen uh, uh, many people who are willing to help, but they can't help. They can't afford to just face all these challenges like harsh uh, weather conditions, poor infrastructure. At some point, you can't even reach at where the people are because of uh, there's no access. And it's not that you are not willing to help, but you don't, you don't, you're not in that environment that will enable you to uh, make that your assistance with the people. So what should we do? We should now think critically and make use of what technology avails for us currently. And for that, uh, people have uh, to come up with some innovations and uh, universities, willing universities that uh, have embraced the new technology, then they work together with uh, refugees who have been learners and see how best can you make sure that this is sustainable, how make, to make sure that you make sure more people are reached out. And now as the people who are in, in the refugee camp who understand very well our problems, who know our difficult, then we might think and find some kind of coming up some, with some solutions which will enable that we get that what we, we, we deserve. Uh, there are so many things which uh, they vary from uh, past, from personal level to community level and up to uh, let's say to the region level. Because when you talk about the living conditions in which people are living in, you you find a student who is a potential student, but that student will not make it to school because he's not his living conditions or our living conditions will not allow her or him to just do the best of herself or himself. And for those, we need to think critically and see how best we can just enable that uh, supporting system, which will help someone who is living in these conditions, maybe to sit in the same class with someone who is in, at the University of Geneva and run the same course with, with the same professor, pass the same exam and pass it. That's what we try to do at this level, despite all these challenges. And uh, when you look very well, the major things that we face is uh, technology, uh, connectivity. Connectivity, because uh, as we find very well, these uh, settings, uh, emergency settings, refugee camps, they are most of the time located into, in, in remote area, rural area, uh, whereby even, uh, which is far away from even major cities from the country. And you'll find there are so many uh, restrictions from local government, uh, maybe ranging from all kinds of restrictions. And all those are challenges that we should not be minimized. And we put all those in consideration and make sure we understand what is available in this area. For example, here in Kakuma, we have been having a challenge of uh, connecting. And for that, we make sure that we try our best to find what is the best solution. Everyone was crying, everyone was thinking that this is impossible, but we gave ourselves time. We took our time and we put ourselves on this work because as a refugee, we have been the first beneficiary of this program. And this program, we believe that higher education programs are not only for us to just be in the camp, sustain us in the camp. They're for us even to live longer, to accompany us throughout our living, our life even after the camp and no one is willing to remain in the camp. That's why we need to think on about solutions which will just even affect us or impact us even after the camp. And that's why we, get, we, get, uh, we, take, we took our time and started to analyze what is working, what is not working, come up with some solutions, some uh, test results that we shared with other experts, we collaborated and we come up with some solutions which at least at this level, people think things are moving as smoothly as no one can imagine. And uh, this has made our proud because now we are feeling like we can. We are not there just to receive food assistance, but we are there also to contribute, to bring solutions and to build our own solution, which will enable us with the support of the university, like the University of Geneva that has come to us and we build something. And for this reason, uh, we came up and say, now we need to build this thing. We need to build something which will make us make sure make sure that 
everyone in our community is get access to higher education and we under because we understand very well their challenges we make in we put in place supporting system that we enable them to make sure that they are in class and this is is this because we are there to care for each other because we have that supporting system because we have that kind of collaborating learning and that collaborative learning it's with the one that is enabling us even to reach out beside or on top or to uh, apart from the learning experience the curriculum uh, i mean the curriculum we go even extra curriculum because we we'll understand each other when we are in the cafe we just interact we can interact on the course we interact even on what's surrounding us and that is a very very powerful process that we engage in so at least we make sure everyone is, is feeling safe and ready to embrace higher education and when we look very well since higher education uh, get into the camp because I reached in the camp before higher education was something which was very very rare but at least I've been there witnessing from when I, before higher education I mean I'm not saying about before like fully before uh, like nothing but I'm saying like it was very very little I could not even talk about it because I never had even for any single person who has benefited from any higher education opportunity then from uh, before and now that higher education has come in the camp, myself, I'm seeing people from uh, who are graduating from University of Geneva uh, in zone programs, how they're supporting initiative in the camp. For example, we have the, the human rights initiative. It's addressing the community problems because those are the people who have been trained who have learned through human rights. And now they bring that human rights and put it to the grassroots, to the people, the beneficiary, who will be able also to spread it into their own community. And what we are looking, we are, we are seeing now, we are seeing something which is particularly, I mean, it might some blur some people because they might feel, no, this is not possible, but it's possible currently as we are speaking. Now, when you see displaced people, they are standing equally with everybody else. There is no difference. You cannot imagine these are displaced people, and this is uh, an ordinary person who is enjoying his full, uh, I mean, right. So, and this, you find that uh, displaced people are making global impact. They are speaking at international conference because they have been empowered, because they have been given that opportunity to also represent and share what they have and engage others in, and also be, feel like being part of this world. Thank you so much, Innocent. Uh, I'll quickly uh, run through uh, the next uh, slide, uh, basically just showing us how we've used uh, our learning ecosystem and different uh, types of technologies integrated into our pedagogy to actually uh, begin to scale. Um, it is difficult to scale quality pedagogy, um, but we scaled incrementally and at any one site now with a number of people uh, that I've listed, we can uh, support up to 160 learners now with our ecosystem. And the next one, and then I'm handing it over to Alan, just uh, quickly the key takeaways. Um, what can universities uh, actually bring uh, into the space? We can bring the research element, uh, technology enhanced skill acquisition, uh, how does it look like? Uh, you know, what does ethical research look like in those uh, environments? How can we be community-centered? Um, what kinds of connectivity options are viable? Uh, how can we build pedagogies that uh, thrive on online, offline learning? Uh, what kinds of apps and devices for indigenous knowledge production can be leveraged? Uh, and then, obviously, also higher education in fragile contexts. Uh, universities do have a civic engagement obligation, uh, and especially at the University of Geneva, this is a big obligation. Uh, we are in the humanitarian capital of the world, and we are you know, really dedicated to supporting the SDGs. Uh, we are very committed to refugee management, uh, how they design social startups, and that will really lead us over to uh, Ellen and HP. Um, because we have a very exciting partnership uh, going there uh, with, I think, very novel ideas that I hope you know, will prove uh, their mettle uh, in the years to come. 
Uh, we also thrive on university partnerships, uh, but uh, the enabling partnerships are really what we're looking at, and with that, I would like to turn it over to Ellen. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Ellen Jakowski. Uh, I lead uh, HP Sustainability Strategy and Innovation Programs. And I'm here to talk to you today about the incredible partnership that we've been able to uh, create within Zone and the University of Geneva uh, and show you an example of the work that we've been able to do in the Azraq Refugee Camp. So just a little bit of background about HP. Um, sustainability uh, is in our DNA. It's something that was uh, founded um, at the very beginning of our company, uh, our two founders, Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett very, felt very strongly about global citizenship and the responsibility that a company must take um, to do good. It's not a job that is left to a few, as you see by this quote by Dave Packard. It's a responsibility to be shared by all. And this is something that has grown up inside HP over the almost 80 years that we've been in existence, and it's definitely um, alive and well today. Our sustainability strategy is something that we call sustainable impact. The idea here is that HP as a company um, needs to create not only sustainable impact internally for our own company to be sustainable and financially viable and responsible in, in what we're doing, um, but also serve as a lever for our planet, for people, and the communities that we serve to also be able to um, use our technology to make life better for everyone everywhere. So how can HP enable sustainable impact, not just within our company, but outside uh, through our customers and in the communities where we live and work and that we serve? Um, several years ago, we stated a, what for us was um, quite a bold goal, a commitment to enable better learning outcomes for over 100 million people by 2025. And while HP has an education vertical uh, that, that we focus on and certainly lots of PCs and printers and, um, and technology that serves the education market, a goal like this is something that uh, is obviously well beyond um, just our company. This is something where we need to identify key partners to help us achieve something at this scale. Barbara talked a little bit about the challenges in scaling, and this is something that obviously you know, we needed to reach out and identify the right partners to be able to achieve a goal and a commitment like this. Our education strategy and this goal um, is a global goal. It's something that we're trying to realize across the world, and I have a couple of examples um, just for some, some background framing uh, that shows some of the breadth and depth of what we're trying to do globally. In the United States, we've partnered with Black Girls Code um, to help with the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, math, uh, education opportunities for uh, young women across the country. This is also extending globally as well. Um, in Haiti, we have several programs where we're trying to bring economic opportunity um, to the communities in Haiti uh, and provide their families and their children with educational opportunities as well as food and medical assistance as part of reaching our overall education goal. And then when we start looking at the refugee community, we have several programs that we're working on. Um, one with some students in Lebanon partnering with the Clooney Foundation for Justice. Um, but what I'm here to really talk to you about today is what we're doing in ASRAC with the University of Geneva and InZone. HP has a product that we call the HP Learning Studio. And uh, you can see here in the ASRAC camp, we've set one up with the University of Geneva and InZone. And it's a series of PCs that you can see here on the desk. And then over in the right-hand corner, you might see another piece of equipment called the HP Sprout. Uh, and then what you don't see in the photo is several printers that are also in the room. So it's a combination of these three forms of technology, laptops, an HP Sprout computer, and printers that make up an HP Learning Studio environment. This is a product, the Learning Studio, that we sell globally. Um, many classrooms in the United States and the United Kingdom um, all have purchased um, this equipment, the Learning Studio product from HP, and this is a technology um, 
compilation that we wanted to make available as well um, in the, to the refugee community. And the partnership with the University of Geneva in zone seemed like the perfect place to do this. Education is a fundamental human right. And uh, you know, this is a way for us to make sure that we are ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to the latest and greatest technology. So in terms of how the learning studio works, it's really focused on teaching um, communities and the students and the learners that experience Learning Studio to reinvent. Um, it's part of our vision for the classroom of the future uh, to be very interactive and integrated, to offer flexible learning solutions in the classroom, and as Barbara mentioned, opportunities for lifelong learning uh, to develop those critical thinking skills, uh, to enable collaboration, discussion, and debate, in a very interactive setting where you're building relationships through learning. Um, but most importantly, it's student-driven, aimed at helping the students find their passion and inspiring their own creative thinking where they can design their own solutions to the problems that they're facing. And that's exactly what we've seen with the Learning Studio environment in the ASRAC camp. The Sprout is a piece of technology um, that makes the physical digital um, so you can see here in this photo, there's a, um, a writing tablet on the bottom uh, where, that's also an area that can be used for scanning. So you can place physical uh, pieces of technology or equipment and scan those. The top bar of, that, of, the, um, of the equipment here scans whatever is physical and then brings it into the digital environment for the students to morph. So it is one of our latest learning technology pieces of equipment that we've enabled as part of the Learning Studio. I can't emphasize the importance of collaboration in the Learning Studio environment, and the technology that we've designed for it um, really enables that type of collaboration and thinking outside of normal boundaries. In terms of enabling the students to design their own solutions um, with things like the HP Sprout and the laptops and the printers and that combination. Um, we're really asking them and through uh, the facilitation that the InZone team has, has brought to think about what solutions they need and that they can use this technology for. We've seen some really great examples um, of, of entrepreneurship that have come out of uh, the Learning Studio environment in ASRAC, and it's really served as a launch pad of innovation where they've been able to do things like take the example that Barbara showed earlier of putting solar panels on the mosques um, in, in the camp that was enabled from the engineering course to take it to the next level and uh, bring that physical to the digital where they upload um, some of their designs on the Sprout and then can continue to look at the architectural and engineering aspects of what's needed for that type of innovation to happen. Um, we've seen this as well with some other building adjustments that they wanted to make to um, their living conditions where some, some of the safety hazards that are being presented with some of the nails uh, that were being exposed in their living conditions needed some adjustments and they were able to design solutions for that using the HP Sprout in this learning studio environment. So the ability to collaborate and bring solutions to the forefront has been really valuable. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, is provide technology that's used for good in this learning environment. And the type of amazing results that we've seen in the year since we've been up and running in ASRAC and the student-led projects have resulted in innovations that are truly inspiring, things that, you know, when we placed the learning studio there, we didn't really realize, you know, what it would bring, you know, what type of outcomes would it generate. Um, and through the power of collaboration with uh, INZO and the user, University of Geneva, their excellent expertise that they've been able to bring to the learning studio environment, partnered with the capabilities of the technology that HP brings with the inspiration and ideas from the students, um, it's, really, it's really gone well above and beyond any expectations that we initially had. Um, so much so that we're looking at continuing to deploy further learning studio environments in Lebanon together through this partnership. So, you know, the idea of finding the right partner, the right partner that has the same shared values, a shared purpose, and approaches that make sense um, to all the parties is, has really, you know, been a key for success for us. 
finding partners where together we're bringing the right pieces of the puzzles of our own expertise that together add up to more than what we have individually um, is really important. The flexibility um, and drive to make it happen, obviously in, in a location like ASRAC, uh, it, being flexible and dealing with the obstacles that you might not anticipate, um, but, but being ready to partner together and figure out how to overcome it and make it happen is, is really important and to always be solving. And again, this combination of the technology, the innovative spirit, and the partnership has really been incredibly powerful. So together, uh, within Zone in the University of Geneva, we feel we found an incredible partnership to truly create more sustainable impact than, than, we, um, than we could imagine. And the Learning Studio in Ezraq is, is a really incredible example for us. Um, and something where we're taking these learnings and applying them to other projects that we have around the globe in terms of how to make it happen in a more powerful and meaningful way um, to offer education opportunities for everyone everywhere. So with that, Barbara, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Alan. And uh, maybe I, I, I should just also add, you know, from an academic university perspective, um, already it's rather um, unusual uh, for a university uh, to, you know, in, in some ways also be uh, an actor in the humanitarian space. Uh, and obviously that requires, uh, you know, different partnerships. And for us, uh, you know, to inch out of our comfort zone uh, and reach out into the private sector has been uh, an, an absolutely uh, valuable experience. We've learned a lot, you know, from discussing our values uh, and making uh, sure that, you know, through our shared values, we're actually achieving a lot more than uh, we could have imagined uh, at the outset. So we are very incredibly grateful also uh, to HP for having had, you know, the patience to listen uh, to our values and to share their values with us and, you know, for the hard work that had to go into um, making, uh, making this a success uh, and continuing to make this a success. So uh, with this, I will close and, uh, well, thank you for uh, your attention and turn it back over to Leila and Frederick. Thank you so much, Barbara, um, Paul, Innocent, and Ellen for an excellent presentation. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat window, um, again, ranging from um, technology and obviously your pedagogy to um, the questions that you've already started addressing around sustainability. So Frederick and I will do our best to get through as many questions as possible, and then we'll also make sure that your contact information is shared with everybody on the call and with all those of you who will be listening to the recording. So the, I'll start with the first question, and it's Related to something, um, Barbara, that you mentioned at the beginning is this notion of local and global and connecting learners with experts, even though there might not be experts right there uh, where they're located, so let's say in Azraq camp. And it's really about um, just wanting to learn how do you manage tutor-student matching and how do you manage that ongoing engagement and specifically how long are these engagements? Are there four, four sessions, 12 sessions, three months? Are there uh, true mentorships versus the connections around a very specific question and expertise? So uh, essentially, uh, in terms of the dis distribution of competencies, our online tutors are the subject matter specialists, whether they are graduate students uh, or as you know, we're looking at now uh, with HP also uh, their employees and training them up uh, to work as tutors in these very difficult environments. Uh, what we're looking for in the online environment is really uh, the subject matter expert who can support the learner uh, as part of a course. And uh, the engagement is usually for the duration of a course, but as we have discovered, um, many of our online tutors love to come back. Uh, and so, you know, we're also inviting them back. The role of the on-site facilitator is really one where we uh, train up refugee learners who have already gone through at least one or two courses, uh, are familiar with online learning, and can actually support learners uh, in the field. And uh, that is really part of our refugee empowerment 
uh, model uh, where we're saying, look, uh, you've already had a chance to experience this and you are now kind of a pro, uh, so now go ahead and share your expertise with at least you know, a group of five or ten other learners. So that's the distribution. So it's an ongoing, it's basically for the duration of the course. That's the length of the relationship, and some do come back later. Exactly. Okay, great. Thank you. Frederick, what's our next question? Well, the next question came in, uh, and maybe this is for Innocent or anyone. Um, uh, the question is, what do the students think about the quality of the courses, and how do you assess the quality of the learnings? Yeah, uh, if I might speak on behalf of uh, the students, uh, uh, although I, I'm again in the management board, uh, the students are satisfied with what they are gaining, and uh, now students are no longer even interested to go to like traditional university because they are, before there, uh, we, yeah, there was few uh, scholarships which were targeting some higher performing students, taking them from the camp to locate them to maybe to other university abroad. But now uh, students are now, uh, they are kind of having many options to choose from. And with this, uh, this, this flexibility to just allow them to stay closer to their families, to just assist them from where they are and uh, the quality that they get. And the good thing that is encouraging the students about the quality is the outcome, what they do, what the impact that they, how they feel empowered uh, also in the, their community to solve the problems in their local community. And uh, everyone is happy, even they are in the community, because they see the impact just uh, instantly, not waiting for that guy to come back, but the guy is living in the community, and the impact is direct. Great. Thank you so much, Innocent. And actually, related question, and that's probably also for Barbara and, and Paul. Um, how do you assess the success of the program, and is there a certificate issue to the re to refugees at the end of the program? Can you speak to that a bit? Yes. Uh, well, you know, at the outset, we really um, basically launched pilots uh, right from the very beginning. We were very conscious of uh, the kinds of credentials uh, that our learners would be able to hold in hand at the end of a course and at the end of a program. Um, so we did build this incrementally, and we now have uh, learning pathways. Um, we have a collection of courses that are basically, um, you know, human rights, children's rights, ethics, uh, global health, global poverty, and global history that uh, make up a big package together with uh, research components to each course. And uh, all this entire package, for example, uh, goes into a bachelor's in international relations at Kenyatta University in Kenya. Uh, and we're beginning to launch the same package also in the Middle East. Um, there are other packages uh, that are made up uh, of medical courses, basic medical, um, public health, uh, also go into, with academic credits, into local partner universities or partner universities in the refugees' countries of origin uh, for those refugees who return home. So every single course uh, that uh, we have on offer, with one exception, uh, is actually uh, earning European credit transfer credits, uh, which is a globally recognized uh, European invention, um, that a system that all universities, at least in Europe, uh, abide by and which uh, represents a credential that is um, usable the world over. That's excellent to hear because it is um, just from our work uh, with NLG in MENA region, we know how critical proof of learning is for both accessing other education opportunities and obviously for, for livelihoods. Um, we are at the top of the hour, and while we have a few additional questions, we're going to respect everybody's uh, time for, uh, obviously, thank you all for joining us and, and staying with us for these 60 minutes. And those of you who are going to be listening to the recording, you have the opportunity to connect with the speakers as we will be sharing their contact information. And a huge thanks to Barbara, to Paul, uh, Innocent, and Ellen for 
um, sharing the work that you're doing together in ASRAC and in Kakuma and more broadly. Clearly, there are a number of opportunities for partnering and, and also learning from, from you as, as you learn and as you scale and sustain these programs. So thank you, everybody, for um, listening to our final webinar for uh, this calendar year, and stay tuned for the future webinars and resources on the NLG Tech Task Force website. Over to you, Frederick. Well, thank you very much, and I want to echo a big thank you to all four of the speakers, and also to Leila for producing this series of most uh, uh, impressive and uh, uh, this uh, is just fantastic work that's going on there. And uh, again, as Leila said, we can't wait to see how you sustain and scale these uh, initiatives. So thanks, everyone. I wish everybody a great uh, rest of your day. If you could take a minute or two to answer the webinar satisfaction poll that will show up in your browser, that would be great. Um, take care, and we'll be back in touch soon. Bye-bye.